It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Much have been made about the alt-right movement and its elements in the United States. Alt-right was key in the campaign that elected Donald Trump as president. Some say that this alt-right movement is now emboldened and the electoral victory of Donald Trump in the U.S. has had far-reaching impact in places like United Kingdom and continental Europe, where the right-wing nationalistic parties has a particular rooted history. In fact, Donald Trump's electoral victory was celebrated by many on the far right in Europe. This has included the National Front's Marie Le Pen in France, Gerrite Wilders, the anti-Muslim leader of the right-wing nationalistic Dutch Freedom Party, and the neo-Nazi Golden Party in Greece. The Golden Dawn Party of Greece issued a video statement where its spokesperson Elias Kassidiaris declared, Στις αμερικανικές εκλογές νίκησαν οι δυνάμεις που αντιμάχονται την παγκοσμιοποίηση, αντιμάχονται τη λαθρομετανάστευση και είναι υπέρ των καθαρών εθνικών κρατών, υπέρ της αυτάρκειας στην εθνική οικονομία. Μια μεγάλη παγκόσμια αλλαγή έχει ξεκινήσει και θα συνεχιστεί με την επικράτηση των εθνικιστών στην Αυστρία, της Μαρή Λεπέν στην Γαλλία, της χρυσή Αυγής στην Ελλάδα. Joining us now to discuss this resurgent right in Europe and their connections to the U.S. is award-winning investigative journalist and academic Nafis Ahmed. Mr. Ahmed is the creator of Insurge Intelligence, a crowd-funded investigative journalism project, and a columnist for Middle East Eye, Vice, among other publications. Welcome back to The Real News, Nafis. Thank you, Shamane. So, Nafis, uh, you have published a four-part investigative report just last summer called Return of the Right, Mapping the Global Resurgence of Far-Right Power. Just give us a brief overview of what you tried to cover in this series and uh, what you found out in, in your investigations. So, this, uh, this investigation was uh, commissioned by um, a charity based in London called Tell Mama, which is a, a national charity which specializes in hate crimes against Muslims. Um, and um, they, they basically asked me to do this investigation in several parts to look into really the way in which the far right is operating as a, as a network globally. Um, so, what I tried to do was look at the was precisely to look at these links between the transatlantic links between the United States, Britain, and and Western Europe in particular. Um, but what I ended up um, really finding out uh, uh, is the extent to which all of the kind of mainstream, increasingly mainstream, right wing nationalist parties that are now becoming um, part of the political process in, in, in Europe. And by that, I mean, you know, they've got positions in Parliament. Some of them actually have a seat at the table of government due to uh, the coalition politics in these countries. Um, all of them have, and, and many of them are very, very popular. You know, maybe perhaps, say, some of them are the most popular parties in the polls. Some of them are the third popular parties and so on and so forth. But they're very much increasing in popularity. Now, what I uncovered is, first of all, is that a lot of these parties actually have a direct uh, heritage, historical heritage, with uh, local Nazi parties that were linked to the Nazi regime during the Second World War. There's a direct historical linkages. That was one very disturbing component of the investigation. The other disturbing component of the investigation is the way in which these parties have been forging links with each other to form a network, an, a, an organizational network, where they actually coordinate tactically. And thirdly, that they have transatlantic connections with groups inside the United States, with white supremacist movements, some of which are well known, you know, like David Duke and all of those guys, um, but also with the most extreme right-wing elements of the Republican Party, including the people surrounding Donald Trump. Uh, 
Um, and it's be- worth bearing in mind. I mean, everyone was going, on, everyone's going on now about um, Donald Trump. They've looked at his appointments, such as Jeff Sessions, uh, you know, as proposed Attorney General, and some other people um, who who have these kind of white, you know, like people like Steve Bannon, and they're kind of various white supremacist or alt right connections, as it's been put. Um, but I put this report out um, in, in the summer, um, and we had basically been warning that Donald Trump has got these very entrenched white supremacist connections, and he actually has, through people that he who, he had appointed to his campaign team, he had direct connections with neo-Nazi parties in Europe. And I, I use the term neo-Nazi very deliberately. This is not a term I'm using lightly. I mean, some people will say, why are you using the word Nazi? You know, we shouldn't use the word Nazi. It's, it's, it's too extreme, blah, blah, blah. No, it's not. I, I was alarmed to discover that, that many of the parties we're talking about here, these political parties that are becoming more acceptable in Europe and that people inside Donald Trump's campaign team have been working with, they are actually neo-Nazi parties. And some of the people involved in these groups actually go back, you know, their, their heritage, as I said, goes back to active Nazi movements, um, in, during the Second World War, which actually, th- that's the history of some of these political movements that we're seeing. So it is actually very alarming, and that's why we decided to call the report the ret- Return of the Reich, not because we're saying that we're seeing, you know, the simplistic reappearance of, of, of Nazism. No, on the contrary, what we're seeing is what I've called, or created a phrase for this, reconstructed Nazism, where... In fact, what we see is these Nazi groups, which have, they, in terms of their heritage, they can trace back to actual Nazi political movements in parts of Europe. What they are now doing is tactically operating in such a way as to uh, parade themselves as anti-Nazi, whether it's the Austrian, uh, whether it's the Austrian uh, FPO or it's Geert Wilder's party or it's Le Pen's party. We have these very well-known anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish parties, which are now mobilizing on the basis of an anti-Muslim ticket and saying that they're actually against Nazism. But what we find is when we dig deeper into the history of these movements and how they've operated, and in fact their ongoing connections today, institutional connections and so on and so forth, the Nazi element actually remains there but what they're doing is they're trying to conceal it tactically because they know that Nazism is not acceptable uh, in, 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 in mainstream politics, in mainstream society. It's not accepted by anybody. It would be rejected if it was, if it was openly paraded in that way. So there is this very tactical effort. And um, what, I, what appears to be happening is it's, that's why there is this relationship with the counter-jihadist movement in the United States which is very useful because the counter-jihadist movement operating around people like Robert Spencer, Pam Geller, and so on and so forth, this convergence of interests is, is useful because it allows these groups to mobilize on the basis of anti-immigration, anti-Muslim, um, mono-ethnic kind of uh, campaigning. Um, so th- and that's where we see this reconstruction of the Nazi ideology taking place. Now, uh, Nafiz, uh, you made reference to the deep connection uh, that the Donald Trump campaign and the people that he has appointed has to the neo-Nazi movement, which I believe would be very concerning for some of the people who might have even voted for Donald Trump. Um, give us a sense of uh, who these uh, people might be. I know Steve Bannon has been uh, connected to the alt-right, but how deep does that connection uh, run? Well, I think the biggest, I mean, it's Steve Bannon, the focus on Steve Bannon and Jeff Sessions is, is important and raises various questions, I think. What hasn't really been looked at so far is what we highlighted in our report, uh, which was the role of people like Frank Gaffney, now, Donald Trump, as is well known, he quoted an opinion poll that was commissioned by Frank Gaffney's Center for Security Policy. Now, Frank Gaffney is a former Reagan official. 
uh, well known as a kind of near conservative, hard right, you know, kind of anti Russian agitator for um, a hard kind of military, militaristic response to various threats and so on and so forth. Um, he became more well known uh, in recent years as he became more and more involved in anti Muslim bigotry, became involved in the kind of counter, this counter jihadist movement. Um, where there has been all sorts of rhetoric about uh, and conspiracy theorizing, you know, about the so-called you know Muslim Brotherhood infiltration of of, of um, the White House, and you know he was he's also even been a member, if I recall, of uh, PNAC, the Project for the New American Century. Yes, that you know the kind of the Bush era think tank which agitated for the Iraq War, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, and he's also involved in kind of all the kind of Muslim birther conspiracy theories about about Obama and so on and so forth, and all that kind of stuff. Um, what's not so well known is that so so Donald Trump. It, it is known Donald Trump quoted this opinion poll that Frank Gaffney had produced or his center had produced, basically saying that you know, the majority of American Muslims are, are pro-extremism, pro-terrorism. And he used this to justify his call to ban Muslim immigration to America. That's very well known. Um, what isn't so well known is that he then populated his campaign team, his, his, his national security advisors, during his campaign with people from the Gaffney think tank. So people like Claire Lopez, People like uh, Joseph Smith, Schmitz, um, people like Walid Ferez, who's been pitched as someone who could play a role in his administration. Um, so these people were heavily involved in giving him advice. All of them are basically kind of near conservative. They have uh, various extremist views about about again, again, very sweeping extremist views about it. all Muslims are blah blah blah, all that kind of stuff. But what's interesting is that very close link and the influence that Gaffney had. Even though Gaffney, as we know, was appointed by the other Republican presidential candidate at the time, Ted Cruz, he was his national security advisor. So interestingly enough. Gaffney had managed to, and, so, and this is important to recognize, Gaffney has been lobbying the right-wing elements of the Republican Party for more than a decade. And he has influence, despite his extremist views. He has a lot, he ha used to have extensive funding from the defense industry. That has now been reduced to, I think, one giant defense conglomerate. I believe it's Boeing that uh, currently funds CSP, uh, Center for Security Policy. So, but Gaffney had basically had, he had his fingers in both pies as the Republican Party. Um, and what this meant really is that through Gaffney, there was influence from far right organizations in Europe within both of the campaign camps during the uh, Republican president, during the whole Republican campaign. You had these guys having this ideological influence. So the question is really what is Gaffney's? connections to the European far right that I'm talking about. Now, and this is where we open this quite alarming can of worms that someone like Frank Gaffney, who dresses himself up as being very anti-Russia, um, skeptical, you know, very kind of skeptical of, uh, of, of Vladimir Putin, and he's also uh, dresses, dresses himself up as being very pro-NATO, has aligned himself with groups that are actually getting funding from Russia, funding from Putin, and are actually supporting the breakup of the European Union and the breakup of NATO, people like Gert Wilders. Um, so to get to the crux of the issue in terms of what is Gaffney's relationship to these European far-right groups, I can give this example of how Gaffney sits on the board of an organization called the International Free Press Society, now, this organization, one of the other persons on the board alongside Gaffney is a guy called Paul Bellion, who's a Belgian journalist, who's married to an MP um, with the Belgian VB, or the Vans Belang Party, which is well known as a neo-Nazi party. It was successor to an organization, a party called Vans Bloc, um, which was actually directly related to um, Nazi activities in that country during the Second World War. And in fact, um, Paul Bellian's uh, father-in-law, 
um, was actually a Nazi collaborator. Um, so Paul Bellian himself, a Belgian journalist, he is all. He also then went on to join the campaign team of Geert Wilders. Um, so Geert Wilders, as we know, is, is in charge of the, um, the the Netherlands Freedom Party. Um, and from there, the networks go on. You know, Geert Wilders is very closely connected to Le Pen. Both Geert Wilders and uh, Marine Le Pen, who, in, in, who, who heads the National Front in France, again, very well known as a previously anti-Semitic neo-Nazi party, which has now tried to rehabilitate itself. Well, both of those uh, parties, they share membership of a European parliamentary group which sits in the European Parliament, which one of their co uh, uh, colleagues in that group is the Austrian Freedom Party, the, or the, the FPO, um, which is also a neo-Nazi party, um, which is very closely linked to neo-Nazi fraternities um, in Austria. And in fact, when that, par that party was also, again, another party that was a successor to... Um, an actual Nazi movement that actively collaborated with the Nazis during the Second World War. Again, there's been a very concerted effort after the 1980s and 1990s where there is huge controversy to rehabilitate itself. But it's known inside Austria, there's been all sorts of historical research which has shown that even that rehabilitation process was enabled by various neo-Nazi fraternities. Now, this is going on, and all of these groups happen to be, all of these individuals, these characters, are very close to Frank Gaffney. Frank Gaffney has uh, invited these people to conferences. In fact, this uh, organization I mentioned, the IFPS, the International Free Press Society, that were, that's involved some of these people on their board, has helped Gaffney organize various counter-jihad conferences, where he's invited very well-known counter-jihad experts like Robert Spencer, like uh, Pam Geller, um, and other people to, 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 to pontificate on the danger and the threat from, from, you know, from Muslims all over the world. Um, so this gives an example of what I'm talking about when I say that there is this very real neo-Nazi kind of influence, ideological influence. Now, what I think is important to recognize is that I don't know whether Donald Trump knows or understands the extent to which people that he's been appointing or people that he is dealing with are, um, have these connections, have this ideological influence. I don't even know to what extent Frank Gaffney understands that the people that he's dealing with, like someone like Gert Wilders and Marine Le Pen, for example, they are people who have very frequently visited Russia they're very frequently, I mean, there's been um, reports that Marine Le Pen has received funding from banks which are very close to the Kremlin. These are very credible reports which show that there is an active effort by Putin, for example, uh, whatever you think of Putin, that there is an active effort by Putin to use some of these far-right groups in order to pursue his own geopolitical agenda, which he wants to see a weakened Europe, um, he wants to see a weakened NATO. Now, Again, we all have our criticisms of NATO, but the point I'm trying to make here is here we have Gaffney, who dresses himself up as this Cold War hawk, working with people who are advocating this neo-Nazi ideology, um, but at the same time are working with people who are traditionally people who you would say are, are his enemies. It's a very strange situation, and it makes you wonder what is going on, and I think... What is definitely going on beyond a doubt is that there is an active tactical effort by these groups which have a Nazi heritage, a very real and active Nazi heritage, to rehabilitate themselves and enter the corridors of power. What we're seeing is that domestically, in their own countries, they are having some, some success. And internationally, they're having success, but they're convincing various groups and parties which otherwise would view these groups very skeptically, and they're using the counter-jihad ticket and the anti-Muslim ticket and the anti-immigration ticket to get into those corridors of power, and it's working. They're using people like Frank Gaffney to get inside the Republican Party, to get inside you know, the office of Ted Cruz, for example, and to influence their thinking and to influence levers of power, and it's working. This is what we call entryism. 
Entryism is a process of actually trying to actively infiltrate politics. The term entryism was originally used to talk about what communists were doing. Oh, it's the communist threat. The communists are trying to influence uh, uh, you know, our government. We need, to have, we need to witch hunt the communists out. It's not the communists we need to worry about. It's the neo-Nazi movements. That is what is actually happening. And I do believe that the Donald Trump administration, there is an active process of entryism taking place, and it's succeeded. Now, uh, Nafis, this is a strange uh, bedfellows here, as you say, anti-Muslim uh, or anti-Islam sentiments combined with anti-communist uh, and also anti-Semitic um, uh, activity. Explain that a bit more. It's very, very abstract here. Well, I think what's important to know is that these movements are very malleable. They are able to change the way that they mobilize politically in order to suit what works for them. Um, if we look at the way in which they've mobilized historically, there's been a number of historical studies which I mention in the report, which have been done by much more seasoned historians than I, who have, have had actual real expertise in looking at the history of, of, of Nazism and the way in which the ideology involved. And one of the interesting things that they showed is that the Nazis had um, a range of approaches to Muslims and Jews during the time that they were in power. There were times when the Nazis were very interested in working with Muslims against uh, Jewish communities, and they wanted to play off uh, Muslim groups against Jews. There were other times when they did, they they actually tried to they were uh, mobilizing against Muslim groups. Um, and what we see happening now is there has been this tactical shift where groups like the, the, the Austrian FPO, for example, we've seen that this, and this is a really interesting dichotomy because the FPO, um, there is very clear documented evidence uh, that the, the leader of the FPO who, and it's a very popular party now. You know, it has access to the Austrian government. You know, they have people at the table in that government there. Um, there is very serious influence in Austrian politics. They were on the cusp of winning uh, the elections um, a while back. Um, so, but, that, but the, the leader of the FPO is someone who has been... I mean, there were a couple of scandals in, the, in recent years when photographs surfaced of him being seen with various neo-Nazi groups which have been uh, rejected in mainstream Austrian society. Um, there's been lot, various lots of uh, bits of historical work that have been done showing how the FPO, as I mentioned, rehabilitate itself on, on, on the back of existing neo-Nazi fraternities, you know, very moneyed neo-Nazi societies, um, and all sorts of things. But in recent years, the FPO has made a very concerted effort to... Um, make friends with Israel. And in fact, um, there was an article in Haaretz um, re uh, recently which re reported on a recent delegation where various F uh, Austrian FPO uh, MPs, including the leader of the party, went and visited Israel. They were welcomed uh, by the Israel Foreign Ministry. But interesting, the same article pointed out that um, even, in, uh, even though there has been this kind of... Israel is exploring whether you know what are the commonalities of interest between Israel and uh, the FPO. That the foreign ministry still officially views the FPO as a neo-Nazi group with anti-Semitic uh, trends. Um, so there is this very strange uh, sort of um, politicking going on. I mean, we know, for example, that Git Wilders, even though he sits in this European parliamentary group alongside these anti-Semitic parties, makes a big point of going around saying that he's not anti-Semitic, he's against anti-Semitism. Um, he, you know, he's visited Israel many times, he's calls himself a Zionist. Um, but at the same time, his party is very willing to say that they are going to push through um, various legal amendments uh, inside the country that will prevent... Uh, uh, kind of, for example, ritual slaughter or, or uh, circumcision and make these things illegal. And, the, 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 you know, the pretext of doing that is to say we want to target 
Muslims and Muslim extremists, and even though you know this is a generic practice of, of Muslim religious communities, but it's also a practice of Jewish religious communities. And a lot of the Jewish communities inside the Netherlands have expressed fear and concern that this has been happening and that this is what Gert Wilders is happy to promote under the pretext of being anti-Muslim and anti-immigration. Um, but at the same time, it's he wants to pursue laws wholesale which would discriminate against both Muslims and Jews. And and I think there is now this, there is a, a number of Muslim and Jewish groups um, in these different countries are starting to realize that, wait a minute, actually they are, they, they haven't really uh, dropped the anti-Semitism. It's there, it's still there. And this is something very alarming. And, and, it's, and, it's, and that's why we see, when we look at the Donald Trump camp, there are these contradictions. You know, on the one hand, Donald Trump has, has shown that he's very, very close to Benjamin Netanyahu. But on the other hand, he's made many, many anti-Semitic statements in the past, you know, quite grotesque statements he's, he's made about uh, Jews and the Jewish communities, um, which, has been, which has been flagged up uh, in the mainstream press. But how do we understand how this works? And that's what I think partly explains it, is that there is this very concerted effort by these anti-Semitic groups to rehabilitate themselves. And, and in fact, to actually, one of the tactics that they're doing is going to Israel and saying, Israel, we are your friends because we have a mutual enemy, which is the Muslim threat. Ah, very interesting times we live in. Um, I'm speaking with Nafiz Ahmed, who has written an article titled Return of the Right mapping the global resurgence of far-right power. And this is an ongoing discussion. I thank you so much for joining us, Nafis. And we're going to continue to uh, unpack this because this is not as easy to understand as uh, some of us may think. So let's uh, uh, continue our discussion uh, in another segment. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nafis. Thank you, Shamini. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.